Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of StaggerCast. We're excited to bring you part one of a two-part series with the legendary Lanny Benoit. Renowned as one of the best, if not the best, buck tracker ever, Lanny's accolades and reputation speak volumes about his unmatched skills. In this episode, we dive deep into Lanny's adventures, exploring some of his most thrilling encounters with big bucks. We don't stop there though. Join us as we uncover the hidden gems of Lanny's childhood and what it was like growing up as a Benoit, a family synonymous with buck tracking itself. We'll also traverse the hunting landscapes of Vermont, Maine, retracing what it was like to hunt bucks from the 1960s to the early 2000s. You'll be transported to an era where hunting was a way of life, and Lanny shares his first-hand experiences that shaped him into the legendary hunter that he is today. We hope you're ready for some adventurous stories from the woods, sharing laughs, insights, and gripping stories with the one and only Lanny Benoit. Stay tuned for part two, but for now, let's dive into the episode. You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear. You say something wrong, cut! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, shit. All right, ready All right. to roll? We're good to go. <clears throat> All right. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Stagger Cast. We have a... Uh, well-requested guest since the last time we had him on down at Huntstock, and uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction. One of the uh, godfathers <laughs> of buck tracking and the, the reason behind, you know, the sport's grown so much in the past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. We're sitting down here tonight with Lanny Benoit, and uh, we've already been riffing some stories off and yeah. having some laughs and everything, and uh, so thanks for doing this with us, Lanny. We appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I had fun with you guys. Something awful down there to... <laughs> Hunt stock when it was up until one o'clock or one thirty in the morning. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. They a were feeding you the beers that day, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I had too many. Uh, my my. Uh, yeah, I had too many Bud Lights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody wanted to talk to you, so it's hard. Everybody wants to buy you a beer. Next thing you know, it's twenty of them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that was tough for me. I'm not used to being up, but uh, yeah. That uh, late. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. Should, so what did, uh, we usually do an introduction for everybody that comes on, but like I said, you don't need much of an introduction. People know you, but uh, why don't you give everybody a little bit of an update of what you've been doing, what you got going on. I know you said you're building a house up on the lake. You've been keeping busy and all that stuff. Well, about seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, I told my wife I'm all done. I'm not driving any more nails in a house for her or I. I'm all done with that. But no, here I go again. She she blinked at me too many times. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm at the lake building her her place at the lake, so mm, nice. That's keeping me pretty busy. Yep. And yep. it's kind of hard for me too because I'm 77. I don't nobody. Everybody worries about me going up on the roof or putting rafters up, and can't go up there. Why can't I? You know, I, so I still crawl up there and yep. play yeah. around and yeah. But it's helping me, too, because I think that I'll be in better shape to go deer hunting this year. For yeah. sure, for sure. And I just got to find a deer that's uh, average age is like 70-something, so <laughs> you can't run too far. Well, if it's uh, within range, you ain't going to miss it because your uh, shooting ex- expertise is pretty legendary. And a lot of people said you're one of the best shots they've ever seen, so... Oh, everybody exaggerates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you've been... Can I tell you a little story about Sure. That? Oh, yeah. Can oh, I yeah. cut to it? Yeah. So quite a few years ago, this guy shows up at my shop, and he wants to go woodchuck hunting. <laughs> woodchuck hunting. <laughs> I said, okay. This is in the spring, I guess. Mm-hmm. So we're riding around, and all the time we're riding around, he keeps telling me about his 243, how, how it shoots. Got a scope on it. So we're riding around, and he wants me to shoot it. He just keeps talking to me about that. Finally, we're in the middle of the woods there someplace, and I probably shouldn't have done this. And <laughs> and uh, I said, I think I want to shoot your gun. He goes, well, there's, we're in the middle of the woods here. You can't see nothing. You can't shoot nowhere. So I said, I don't care. I just want to shoot your gun. I see you got a you got a bottle there, which I shouldn't be shooting. I said, why don't you throw that up in the air? Throw it up in the air? He goes, I said, yeah, throw it up. I want to see how your gun shoots. Finally, he listened to me, throwed it up, and I went kapowy, and it blew up. And I said, boy, this thing's right on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he called me? Asshole. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that's shit. awesome. Yeah, they, we had a young fella in here yesterday. Uh, we were doing a podcast with him, and I said, 
and it's kind of kind of one of the reasons we're here today is because your the Benoit videos are coming back out at Huntstock, and we and he's never seen them. He's 24 years old. He's never seen them. So I was saying, you ever seen Lanny throw something up in the air and hit it with his with his pump gun? He says, what are you talking about? I said, well, you're in for a treat. I said, when you <laughs> see those videos, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so if the, for anybody that's been living under a rock, yeah, yeah. uh, the, uh, the Benoit videos are coming back out at Huntstock. They're going to be available for sale. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we have sponsored, uh, the recreation of that as well as what Woodman Arms, Woodman Arms yeah. and everybody's so excited about it. So we're, yeah. uh, we're, we're really uh, looking forward to getting down there and, and, uh, seeing the reception and you what you had a, uh, promo code with your yep yeah so if you want to get those dvds uh use code stagger at checkout when you're buying your tickets and uh that'll put you in for a special raffle i guess you did uh, a little special edition with pat an extra story on five copies of the dvds for uh that are being re-released i think so yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there's a raffle for those but i know there's uh, a lot of guys that are buying tickets just to come down and scoop up some dvds are you going to be there to uh, i'm going to be there you're going to be there to sign up or what <laughs> Excellent. you know and it kind of it's kind of hard for me too because that's a snowmobile race because i drag race snowmobiles in Ooh. The, that time of year and i think that's right uh got a race in maine that i like to go to yep. so i'm going to miss that one but it's okay yeah i love deer hunting i like talking to people and and stuff but uh yeah. you mentioned something about throwing stuff in the air on the video and shooting at it can i uh, tell that little story about oh, that yeah, for sure so tom heard about all that and he said i want to see you shoot some stuff in the air i said well, all right uh, <laughs> but here's the thing when you do that you can't do that in vermont here because if you take a 270 it goes a long ways or oh, yeah. six yeah but where we were and you know we're we're in uh, ontario where there's just wilderness for yep 100 miles or more as long as you aim it that way. Mm -hmm. So he went to town that night. And he said, I'll buy some apples. I said, okay. <laughs> I love shooting bean cans years ago because when you threw them up there and you hit them, it unraveled the whole bean cans and the two ends would go this way <laughs> and the bean can would unfold. <laughs> and it threw beans everywhere. <laughs> well, so he comes back with a bag of apples. Guess how big they were? About that big. Oh, man. Little, <laughs> little minis. <laughs> yeah. I said, why did you get the big apples? <laughs> did you hit any of them? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just made it a little harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to do that with a scope, though. You almost need peep sights to do that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Scope's a little tougher. You yeah. switched to the scope when your eyes were starting to go downhill a little bit, right? Because you were running a peep sight all the way through, and then you switched to, what, a Trigicon or something back in the day? Yeah, and the reason I did that, because I was hunting Ontario, mm -hmm. and I was getting some long shots out there with a the peep sight, which is no problem. I shot a lot of deer a long ways away with a peep sight years ago. But i get in a cataract in this eye, and mm. what's happening is when I'd hold it up, I'd have two front sights. Oh, oh. So what would I'd shoot a deer? I was shooting deer with it that way, and just put the deer between the two, and mm -hmm. they seemed to fall down. But so I decided I wanted to put a scope on because I was getting some long shots out there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what happened there. Yep. And by the way, the first of October they're they're going to remove this cataract in my eye here. Oh, nice. So I'm kind of excited about that. So oh, you'll definitely. be ready to roll for hunting season. Imagine how handsome you guys will look when you... Well, maybe be the other way. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to reveal the truth. Oh, yeah. You oh, wouldn't be man. sitting this close to me if you knew what I really looked like. <laughs> uh, so, so you've been you've been getting ready for deer season this year. you got some plans to do some hunting. I, I know Pat said you've been trying to drop some weight, and you said you've been up on the roof getting staying agile as a cat up there. So what's your uh, what's your plan for this deer season? I have a couple spots that I really, I found last year when I went to Maine that I'm pretty excited about. There's a place there where there's this big mountain range. They come from another mountain range through the valley to go across this mountain range. And they're going up and they're slabbing around both sides of this mountain. They're going through a notch on the north side and on, a, on the south side, they're going around the side of the mountain. So I want to go up in there. I was up in there last year one day, and it was all tore up from them big bucks going through there back and forth because they were traveling back and forth all summer. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the rut, they're going that way, and they ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. There's two places they're going to. So um, 
I'd like to shoot another big buck if I could, I think. Yeah, so. we, uh, we, do, we have no doubt that you can do that, so. Well, <laughs> it gets a lot harder when you, yeah, when you can't zoom up a mountainside and. Yeah, we so. were, we were talking about, uh, me and Adam were talking about, like, we were joking, you know, because he's in his 20s and I'm in my 40s and. And we're going to ask you this question, like what, at what age do you think that you were physically and cause of course you're the older you get, the wiser you get. So at what age do you consider when you were at your absolute prime, as far as knowledge and body? Probably when I was the smartest hunter was probably in my forties and fifties. Yep. I was still shooting deer, tracking them in my sixties, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. 65. Yep. I kind of quit hunting the last bunch of years. I haven't really hunted much. But uh, when I was younger, I didn't care if they ran or not. I used to holler at them when I jump them out and run because I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to have to, I used to tell people, yeah, the only thing that's going to save this buck uh, is either dark or a big river. And a lot of them didn't make it that far. I'll be very honest with you. If yeah. you only knew the truth, and I shouldn't be saying this, I shot so many big bucks just driving down the road, see their track crossing. And I'd have that deer within an hour if he wasn't too far away. Yep. I'd just come right up on them. They'd be walking. A lot of times I'd shoot a lot of deer. So they go fast when they're walking on big bucks, but I'd come right up behind them and, and get them. They didn't hear me coming. Uh, we were I shot list- a bunch that way through the years. Now yeah. that's moving. Yeah. yeah, we were listening to a podcast with a, a fella from New York, Joe Donato, there, and he's he's always talking about that last hundred yards, how he takes one step. Were you like that, or you just walk right up and shoot him? No. See what happened when I was younger. I never did that. I didn't yep. do much sneaking. I just moved right in on him and I'd shoot him. And it, my brother used to go with me and goes, "Geez, you're going kind of fast, ain't you?" I don't care. Yep. I don't care if he's running or not. He's going to get it. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Because <laughs> I could shoot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and as I got older, then I had to, I didn't go as fast. Yep. And I became more sneaking and peeking and looking. And mm-hmm. in the last 100 yards or 200 yards, I used to call it the death creep. And I did shoot. But even when I was younger, I shot a few. I snuck right up on them. But I enjoyed it more. When it was a challenge to shoot at him. If you watch one of the videos, I actually kicked a rock and made the deer run. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, I just, the, the camera guy, you going to shoot him? I kept saying that to me. Was you going to shoot him? I can't shoot him. He's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> at least give him a chance to get away. Yeah. yeah he's just, that was a decent buck. It was a great buck. Yeah. I said, he's <laughs> looking at me. I can't, how, I just, it's like shooting a tin can and no sport in it. I yeah. Gotta, you know, I, I've shot a bunch of deer where, you know, when a cat catches a mouse, he plays with it for a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've actually done that in the past with deer. You know, I, I'm not a killer, so. Mm-hmm. And I've let a lot of them go. I've let more bucks go than I probably shot through the years. I was going to say, like, in your, the last, uh, you know, the older you got, the more you enjoyed get, helping other people get deer. Because I remember you saying... You know, how many deer do, how many bucks do I have to shoot, you know? Well, I passed up a lot of big bucks, and there were some world, you know, deer that, like, 170s, 160s. Yep. Uh, the biggest one I passed up was, and I didn't realize it was that nice, uh, it was 190-something. So. Yeah. But I've helped a lot of people that never shot a 200-pound buck. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they tell me that, and I explain to them, well, if you go with me, and have any kind of luck at all, you will shoot a turn pound buck. And and I will say this, like Tim Hartnick, and I'll mention his name, he's from Burlington. I don't think he shot his gun in 15 years. Mm-hmm. I took him to Maine, which is a tough place. And uh, I think the first day out, I said to him, if you sit on that pinnacle right there, this is no scouting. He said, well, sit on that little spot right there. Within three days, you'll kill this buck that's going back and forth here. Because it it, it, you can see there's a buck going back. And I said, it's a 200-pound buck. I don't know what he's got for horns, but it's a 200-pound deer. Yep. Uh, I think the second or third day, shot that deer. Hadn't shot his gun in 15 years. Hadn't even seen anything <laughs> to shoot at. Jeez. And I've helped a bunch of people like that. And uh, hey, Glenn's one of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. We had him on the podcast. and. He, he talked about when you guys first started hunting together, and 
I said, boy, you were lucky to be able to do that with, with, with the Benoits and with Lanny and, and, uh, he, uh, he really, he's really turned into a great hunter. You know? Well, I remember the first morning that he shot his big buck in Maine, the first one he shot, I think it was, he was with me and we found that track. That was the same day that we found the track for Tim Hartnick, mm-hmm. had him down the road sitting and we go up and here's this big, big buck track. And I said to him, we had a little talk before he started tracking it. I said, I want you to track this deer like you haven't eaten in a week. Mm-hmm. That's the mindset you got to have. Yeah, yeah. I said, I want you to pretend that you haven't eaten in a week and you're starving to death and you got to shoot this deer. Yeah. And I said to him, don't come back without shooting this deer. The perfect day today. Today is the best tracking day we've had. So if everything goes good for you, you should be able to come back and we'll take a look at this thing. So after we had like a five or ten minute talk about it, off he went. And he shot the deer. And it weighed 212, 215 or something. Mm-hmm. Had a flunky rack on it, but it was still a 200-pound buck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a trophy. Had a nice big neck on it, big shoulders. Yeah. You know, the rack doesn't always per- You know, I grew up when antlers didn't mean much. Yeah. No, the weight's everything. Up here. Wow, yeah. that was food back when I grew up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why we had two deer seasons. You know that, of course. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about that before. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> oh, man. That's that's so like back in the day when you were young and in your physical prime, you would just get on them and almost run right out of the truck. Just I would just I dogging would them motor down. on them. And uh, I wouldn't always go fast, but I'd go really fast on them to catch up. Uh-huh. And like I say, I shot a bunch of them. I could see them walking through the woods ahead of me. They didn't even know I was behind them. I come right behind them. Yeah, yeah. And um, but the problem with that is it takes, a, you know, you wound yourself pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's what used to happen to me when I hunted just Vermont. It took me a month to recover from the two weeks because mm. I was so beat up bodily. Yeah, really. But I wanted it so bad that yeah, uh, <clears throat> and I wanted to. I don't know how to say this. I wanted to show everybody in town that we could kill big bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to make my dad famous. Yeah. Yeah. On deer hunting. Mm-hmm. That's how that all got started. Yeah. And when I grew up, I used to listen to all these guys talk about deer hunting. So it was drummed into my head. Yeah. And it's something I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I was born, not everybody's born with that, you know, what I had in here. Mm-hmm. And I was born with that and about everything I've done in my life, like snowmobile racing, like I've won 850 finals oval racing. It's unheard of and won all kinds of things, drag racing, snowmobiles, but it's something I... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just thought, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you watch... Uh, I've heard you called the Michael Jordan of deer hunting before, and if you, if you look at some of the stuff they did on Michael Jordan, his his mental state was everything. Like you, you had it in your head, and you had the mental, yeah. uh, and that's that can that can beat out anybody if you uh, have that mental edge and mental sharpness. Well, that's what I was trying to do with Glenn when I had that talk with him. Yep, put this and that into his head, and I'd done that with a bunch of people, and another one I did it with. Um, was my friend um, Johnny Newell. Mm-hmm. Johnny complaining to me all morning. We're riding around in Maine. He's complaining. I can't seem to get one tracking. I said, well, you're just doing something wrong. Let's talk about it. So we talked about it, and we come up over the ridge here, and look, there's a buck track going across the road, about a 200-pound buck track. Mm-hmm. I get out and look at it, and I said, well, he's right up there. So we had a 10-minute talk about it. I said, don't <laughs> come back if you don't shoot this deer. <laughs> yeah but. you know how to do this yep you just pretend you haven't eaten in a week yeah it's my favorite line yeah you got to kill this deer to eat you're gonna starve him to death and then get up there and sneak up on him he's laying down right up there yep hour and a half later he calls me on the walk i got him i said okay i'll come and get you <laughs> yep. that's yeah. awesome so and that's what it's all about if yep. you want to be good at anything it's like shooting skeet um Snowmobile racing. Any kind of yeah, race. Yeah. Yep. You know, and seeing everybody thought for years 
the off season that I lived and breathed deer hunting. That's not true. Mm -hmm. I hardly ever thought much about deer hunting off season. I did all my scouting during deer season. And the reason for that, too, is that uh, <clears throat> if you ever notice, there's always two bucks out in the field out here all summer. Mm -hmm. Rut starts, he's over in Montpelier someplace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't do any good. Yeah. 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 yeah, you would do most of your scouting just in the days leading up to it, just driving around, checking all the cuts and stuff out, right? You were, I mean, you're the king of the road work back in the day in Maine. You've talked about that before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I shot so many deer by driving down the road. And my favorite thing to talk about was Parlin Pond Road, back when they had a lot of bucks on that road. Mm -hmm. Snowed that night, and I started out just before daybreak, and I drive on, headed towards three slides. I found 12 bucks or 11 buck tracks that morning. All good bucks? Decent, decent deer. Bucks, yeah. A couple of them are yeah. decent bucks. Yeah. Most of them are mediocre bucks. Mm -hmm. Something that, you, yeah, you can shoot them, but it's not what I wanted. Finally, I went up by what we called the, and it was a big pine, and it's kind of off towards three slides. And I went up there, and there was this buck track going across. And I said, boy, that looks like a good one. And I told the guy with me, I said, hang on, I'm going to follow it in the woods a little ways, and I'll come back and let you know. I didn't have a gunner out there with me. I just followed. I said, yeah, I, I, this is the one I want to track out of all these buck tracks I've seen. That way, 268. Wow. When I ended up shooting him. And Jeez. he had a nice big 10-pointer, probably scores 150. Yep. Somewhere is around there. Holy cow. But that's when we had deer. But I shot all kinds of deer doing that in Quebec, uh, Ontario, uh, Maine, even New Hampshire. The mm -hmm. last one I shot in New Hampshire, I was riding around, found that track. Yep. Came back the next day and shot the deer. Yep. I mean, who does that? <laughs> Not many people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's like... Uh, Went up northern part of Vermont there in um, Yellow Bog. I found two buck tracks that morning, and the guy with me, that ain't the one. So we had to find the one he wanted, and he didn't even bring a gun. He just wanted to look at the deer. So mm -hmm. we tracked that hour and a half, shot that one yep. from the road. I said, can I come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so I come yeah. back the next day, we shot the other one. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, who does that sort of thing? Yeah. No. Well, I've done that my whole life, and I kind of got spoiled doing that. Well, know? that's the thing, and you did it before all this technology came in. Now nobody's scared of the woods. Back I, when you did it, yeah. there wasn't no Onyx maps. There wasn't no computer to look at when you're in the woods. <laughs> See, we got to talk about that. Yeah. No technology. Yeah. First thing I want to talk about is when I finally figured out how to sneak right up on them, I never could figure out how to turn my gun before I shot the deer. Mm -hmm. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to explain that. <laughs> well, you see, Westerns don't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You know. <laughs> so, anyways, excuse me. John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> but I could, it's hard to twirl one of them big, long oh, things. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. You sure can get the lever is. loop to do that with. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. So, when I hunted Vermont, I never had a compass or yep. anything because the woods weren't big enough here to have one. Why bother? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You go over the Mount Mansfield, you're on the other side. It's obvious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, when I went to Maine, I never had a compass. back. That's all you had back then. So, I wandered all around the mountains and... Somebody said, were you afraid of getting lost? No, I'm in Maine. I'm, I know where I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to look at it. <laughs> well, the woods, even how big the woods were, I'm not, yeah, not going to get lost. I remember yeah. you were telling us about a story of, uh, on the last time we talked, about a guy, or you were like, you ended up two mountains over from where you started a buck, and then you got there to the road, and the guy's like, oh, you need a lift? And you're like, yeah, I need to lift back to so-and-so, and it ended up being, what, like an hour drive? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, I did that two years in a row with that guy. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. That's crazy. That's yeah. awesome. You, you were flying on him back then. I kind of want to take you back into some of the Benoit history and stuff, being that the, you know, the videos are coming back out, and uh, we'll start in the beginning. So, and you kind of talked about how you want to make your dad famous and what you did for him and uh, how you – pursued deer hunting and the attitude you had towards it what was it like growing up with larry as your dad what was it that he kind of instilled in you guys to be deer hunting well he uh he always took me about everywhere as him and i were inseparable when i when we grew up and of course i used to hear about deer hunting when i was a young fellow and 
I can't tell you everything, but uh, when I grew up, we shot a lot of pistols uh, for some reason. We were shooting all the time. Mm -hmm. From when I was just a, I got my first twenty. My first when I was eight years old, I got my brand new Mossberg bolt action twenty two. I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I no more than had that. Ten minutes, and I went in the field, oops, up across the road, and shot a woodchuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I had to do with it, but I shot everything with that stupid little thing. But when I grew up with him, we hunted a lot, fished a lot, did a lot of fishing, mm -hmm. did a tremendous amount of shooting, mm -hmm. and I think that's where I learned how to shoot. I spent hours out in the yard when I was a kid throwing stuff up in the air and shooting at it with a BB gun. And that's how I learned how to do that with the high-powered rifle. You, I could literally, you could literally stand over there and throw it sideways, and I could hit it most of the time with my, with a twenty-two or a mm -hmm. two seventy. Yep. Throw it underhand, and I'd hit the thing. Um, that's because I shot so much with the practicing with the BB gun. Yeah. So as I'm growing up, I'm listening to all these deer stories and these big bucks that are shot and. So I was just, couldn't sleep the night before deer season. So <clears throat> it was, I was being brainwashed into being a hunter and I didn't even know it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's how that goes. And yeah. Of course, I, I grew up in the woods too in Duxbury. I used to go up in the woods and make myself a shelter in case it rained and stuff. And I'd stay overnight in the woods a lot of times even though I live just down there somewhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I'd tell them. And then I used to go fishing by myself a lot, and I'd catch a bunch of brook trout. I'd cook those up for dinner or whatever. Mm -hmm. So And then we used to go bird hunting in the fall, friends of mine and stuff, and we'd cook some of our birds and never bought no food with us. We just ate what we shot. So I kind of grew up in the woods, mm -hmm. sort of. Um, I think that helped a lot because I wasn't scared of nothing in the woods. And yeah, that's big. Yeah. So, was there any? Was there ever any uh, growing up with the with the brothers? Was there any ever like uh, competition or uh, competitiveness with you guys, or did you guys all just kind of coexist, or how did that? How was that? I dynamic? don't remember any competitiveness in the hunting thing. Yep. Uh, Could have been. I think there was with maybe my brother Lane. He was always competitive especially with my brother shane yeah yeah but uh i was never trying to outdo anybody i was just yep i was just busy dragging and shooting and running through that's the woods that's right you were doing it for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of dragging oh yeah <laughs> yeah so you guys started out in vermont obviously and at that point larry wasn't hunting in maine right you guys were all just vermont just vermont so what was that like back and you said duxbury and you know we're in waterbury now so right right over there what was deer hunting like back then was there a lot more big bucks in vermont in like this central vermont region or was it what was it like then versus now would you say well there was way more deer back then really you gotta remember in 1968 we shot eighteen thousand bucks in this state oh, if, wow. if you got them if you can look it up you'll see that eighteen thousand bucks no wow. dogs jesus so there was a lot of bucks around if you wanted to shoot a deer. Mm -hmm. But also you have to remember we had way more deer hunters back then. Yep. They used to sell, even way back then, they'd sell about 150,000 hunt license. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. Oh, well, everybody's doing it just to eat, right? Like you were saying before, that was time to eat. Yeah, people needed to eat. And they had plenty of deer. Oh, yeah. We mm -hmm. were yeah. loaded with deer. We went to Waitsfield one time, my dad and I were riding with them, and there was 40 deer across the road. Mm -hmm. 40 deer? Holy shit. Yep. No kidding. This should wow. come down off in Route 100, and then you go like this to go to Waitsfield. Yep. Right there. We counted every one of them. They come out, come from over there, across Mad River, went right over and went up this side. 40 deer across the road right there in front yep. of us. 40. That's that's crazy. <laughs> you just kept coming. You'd be lucky to see one or two crossing the road if you're doing that lap every day, you know, yeah. that, that route. Well, think about it. In 68, we shot 18,000 bucks in the state. Yep. And I'm not wrong. You looked that up. You'll no, see I, you. I, yeah. I've heard of that, yeah. No. So was it hard sifting through the small ones? Because there must have been a ton of small ones for every big one in Vermont back then. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had that happen in Jay Peak there. I'm way up on top up there, and I find this big buck track. And 
I jumped him out up way up in the short spruces, and he kind of run down, and he's headed off, headed kind of south there. So we just got out of the thick spruces there, and I look, and I see another deer track coming down in front of me mm-hmm. in his tracks. Well, I look, and guess what? It's one of them four-pointer things. <laughs> so what does he do? He stops and keeps blowing at me. Yeah. But he keeps following that big buck. So I'm trying to shoot the big buck, and this thing keeps blowing at me. And you can see where the big buck runs again. I said, you little bastard, will you get out of the way? <laughs> he finally veered off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even back then, there wasn't, you know, a lot of big 200-pounders in the center of Mott region. Is it just still more north back, even back then, or was there more kicking around than you think? Because now, nowadays, you kill a 180-pound buck in the central Vermont region and all the way down to the southern part of the state, and that's that's a real big buck. There's not a lot of 200 I don't pounders. think the big bucks are here like they used to be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And same with Maine. Mm-hmm. Now, I hunted Maine last year, and I found all kinds of buck tracks, mm-hmm. lots of them. They're all 150, 40. Yeah. You might see a 170-pounder if you're lucky. Yep. Uh, boy, it was tough finding a couple of big buck tracks, and I did find some big ones too. But there's you, yeah, few and far between. Yeah, there's a lot of young. The deer herd's young, is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I heard that uh, listening to a couple different podcasts and radio shows too. That they said it's going to be good in another year or two if if we have some more easy winners. But right now, it's just a lot of young ones. Yeah, last year a ton of young young ones. I mean. <laughs> You could shoot a deer easy enough, but yeah. is that what you want to shoot? Yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. Exactly. So after Vermont kind of got hunted out, and I know they got hunted hard back then, there was less and less deer, you guys made the shift to Maine. What was it that made you go to Maine? Like, did you hear something about, like, oh, there's a bunch of big deer running around up there, or was it just kind of on a whim? How well, did that what happened transpire? was we used to hunt Eden and, um, and Belvedere mm-hmm. and Jay Peak, and we could always find big buck tracks up there. Yeah. And we shot a lot of big bucks up there. Mm-hmm. Well, pretty soon I'm young and I'm running all over these mountains and I can't find anything. Mm-hmm. So I come down out of the woods one day and I said to my dad, we're moving. Oh, no, there's been big bucks here for years. I said, there ain't none no more. And we're leaving. Yeah. And that's the first time we left deer hunting country. From there we headed up into northern part of Vermont and we found big bucks again. And the same thing when we hunted through through years in Maine. That's why we got buses instead of a deer camp. Because mm-hmm. what happens is you can clean out a place and it takes two or three years for it to come back when nobody's hunting it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what's happened and what happened with us, I used to be the scout. I find a place of big bucks, we go hunt it, we'd shoot them. The next year the bucks got smaller, next year they got smaller. So you got to move. Yep. That's why we had buses. So we kept moving around the state. Yep. And uh, the Best year we had was Parlin Pond Road. The first year we moved there, and we shot seven 200-pounders that year. Jeez. Was oh, ten guys shit. that came to camp, and they shot seven 200-pounders. Well, after that, it kept going down, 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 down. a little bit. Yeah. But the only thing that saved it for quite a while was there was some big country there that was not logged off and left alone. Yep. So they kept coming out of the big country. But that's where you what you had to do years ago if yep. you wanted to shoot big bucks every year. You had to move, mm-hmm. move, move, move. Mm-hmm. And we were doing the same thing in Ontario, too. Mm-hmm. Game warden stopped me one day, and we're way up by Sand, Cur- uh, Sand Lake. And we're camped down by S- Silver Lake. Mm-hmm. What are you doing way up here? It's 85 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell him the truth. I said, well, we're hunting everywhere. I said, why can't yeah. I hunt up here? Yeah. Well, we already shot three four big bucks down there. And so we moved and went up there. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it the same reason you kind of went from where you went from Vermont to Maine searching for big bucks? Was it the same that you went to Ontario? You went from you kind of hunted them all out of Maine and there was less and less. So you shipped it to Ontario and then started getting into them up well, there. Well, start getting played out in, in Maine. There. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you can still shoot big bucks. But oh, yeah. It just weren't the same. When I first went to Maine in 72, it was like going to Ontario when I went to Ontario. Yep. You didn't wonder if you were going to shoot a nice buck. You just wondered how big it was going to be yep. because that's yep. the, that's what we had in the woods. Mm-hmm. You were going to shoot a 200-pound buck if you were fussy. Mm-hmm. One of the problems deer hunters had for years, they get all they shoot a buck, the first buck they see, now their tag's gone. Yeah. 
Yep. That's that. it's gone. <laughs> uh, I'm a I'm 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 a guilty of that. Well, I know, but the problem is you're guilty of it. But if you don't shoot that deer and you want some deer meat, I know. you may not get a big buck because they ain't yep. there. Yep. You can't catch a big fish in a fishing hole if they ain't one in there. Mm-hmm. Amen. And that's yep. why scouting is so important. If you want to be a big buck shooter, you got to find your big bucks and hope they don't roam too far. And here's the problem in Maine. Some places there ain't a lot of does. Yeah. And there's a big buck on this mountain range. All right. You remember when, well, maybe you still do. I mean, you drive 30 miles to go to a bar, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, that's what they do. They, they walk 20 miles to go over there because there's a bunch of does over there and they know it. Yep. Yep. So what happens, they start wandering further and further. And that's what happened to Ontario. What happened was a big buck would stay in this little area because there was plenty of does. Well, pretty soon there weren't hardly a lot of does, and they started wandering. Okay. So you didn't know where you're going to end up if you found a big buck track in Ontario. Mm-hmm. When I first hunted there, they didn't go nowhere. Yeah. They were just hanging out in one little pocket, and that was it. They had all the girlfriends they wanted, and yeah. they just hang there. Yeah. But towards the end, they were wandering like they did in Maine and New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, you can find a big buck track over there and end up 20 miles away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's a fact. Yeah, you're putting on the boot, boot miles for that, those ones. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. This son of a bitch ever going to stop? <laughs> yeah, he lays down for a little while, and he gets up and goes again. Yep. Yeah. And you gotta be, they're, they're trotting just like you're trotting through the woods at, at that time of year. Yeah. So they go through pockets. If mm. you ever track a lot of big bucks, they'll go through pockets. Yep. Sniff everywhere. Ah, there's nothing here. Psh, off they go again. Yep. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way it goes. Uh, yeah, that's that's crazy. So yeah, what you do is you sling your gun on your shoulder when you're younger and go, "Okay, buddy, <laughs> I don't care where you're going, you're that's, gonna get it." Yeah. I shot one in Maine one year. I don't remember what year it was. I was the last one to shoot a deer. I was helping everybody shoot deer, help four people shoot deer, and I finally had my chance. I said, mm-hmm. "All right, now I can shoot one." So we drive up and we're in Rangeley. And we're there's a pond, not Rangeley Pond. There's a pond next pond over. Yep. So we drive way up there. There's a skid road, went up in there, and there's a buck track crossing right there where we parked the rig. And I said, you said that looks like a 200 pounder. So I got out and started tracking it first thing in the morning. Well, I finally shot him. Finally got a ride back, left the deer over there. Well, actually, we, yeah, I left the deer over there. So when I get back, my dad said, where'd you shoot him? I said, just look at the furthest mountain you can see in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking around. I said, yeah, just look at the furthest one. Oh, man. Shot him right on top of that. Yeah. And the way off must have been, I don't know how far it was, 10, 15 miles away. Yeah. But I had to do some covering. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom in. And I shot that sucker from here to the curtain, I guess. Yeah. No oh, shit. Boy, was, he must have been some proud of you, though. I mean, to be able to do that, and, you know, he must have said, well, I did something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I used to be proud of me because I used to, I used to, I did that all the time. Find a buck track, just try, there's one. Oh, yeah. I used to, and I ain't bragging about that, but that's how I used to shoot him. You know, and there's a guy that you should do a podcast with is Bernie Champney, too. He's been with me for years, yep. and he used to see me do it all the time. Is that yeah. uh, Tuffy? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, we know him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to, he'll tell you the same thing. Boy, you put him out on a buck track. I think God, his life is done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to get coffee in the mobile every morning, me and his dad, and we'd see Tuffy every morning. Yeah. He'd be in there telling stories every morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've done that a lot, and it works. Yeah. I mean, why wander the mountains when you can drive down? Oh, here's one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what killed a lot of bucks for you, is just knowing to do that, that road work and figuring out where they are where they're crossing and then getting yeah. on it and going you yeah so you keep going well after a while like, you get to figure out deer you go you're driving on a road yeah. you got to go up here because this looks like where they'd cross you mm-hmm. haven't seen it yet to say you're in a new place yeah. yeah but you know deer habits oh yeah, yeah. so you go drive up yeah okay there's one i've been <laughs> driving down the road and i had my van one morning doing 45 miles an hour i looked over and i see this buck track going up a bank i slammed the brakes on backed up Never even went and looked at the track. I told the boys, just come back sometime this afternoon. I'll be around somewhere. I'm going after that one right there. Well, you ain't even looked at it yet. I don't got to. Uh, <laughs> you're all going up the bank like this. Yeah. He's got a big chest on him. Motoring. 
<laughs> I remember in one of your videos, you're, it's there's no snow, but you're looking at a, a big buck track in the road, and you're like, you know, if uh, there was snow on the ground, this deer would have all it could do to keep its life. And I said, that's a great quote right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Though. Oh, yeah. I've done it so many times that it's crazy. Oh, man. I was talented to be a snowmobile racer and a deer hunter. Not some. many people get two things they're good at. Most people only get one. That's really that's really something. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> the guy upstairs looked after me my whole life. Yep. 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 And I'm agnostic. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> going uh going back to Maine, we we're just talking about you were talking about Parlin Pond and you guys had a good year. You killed what, seven you said out of the, out of camp that year, over two. Yeah. Um out of all the years you guys spent up there, what was like you hear people say like the golden years of Maine? In your opinion, what was the golden years of Maine? Um, I would say before I even got there. Really? I'd say 60s on up through to 90s. 60s and 90s? Yeah. You, when did you guys start going there? 80s, was it? Or before that? 70s. Late 70s, 70s, yeah. Uh, 72 was the first year on Maine. No kidding. Mm-hmm. That was a minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's crazy. What? So, And another thing you were talking about. Which I had a question I wanted to ask you about. What percentage of the deer that you killed back in the day were you killing up high? Did you kill a lot of deer up high or did you kill a lot of deer down low or in between? Where would you say how it broke down at the number of bucks you killed high versus middle of the mountain versus low? The easiest ones I shot were up high. Up high? Most of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How come, you think? Uh, it's quieter up there, I think. Yep. And most generally. And they're more laid back. The deer are. Yeah. A lot of times they go up there see what people don't realize. During the summer when the bugs are bad, the deer go up high to get away from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're used to being up there. Uh, most of my big bucks I've shot up high, but don't don't get me wrong, I've shot a lot down low, but the easiest ones are up high. I catch mm-hmm. them sleeping, laying down, don't even know them there. They're just careless <laughs> up there. They just feel safe, and that's. I think so. Yep. <coughs> Seems less, that less way. Less predators up there and stuff. And a lot of times up there, it is, it's quiet. You can just yeah. walk along and. Yeah. That green growth, real it's, soft, needle. Yeah, you bottom. can sneak right up on them, and you can still go fast and be quiet. But I used to have really good eyes too, and I ain't bragging about that. But my eyes used to be really good, and I could spot stuff in my peripheral visions off to the side, like I can see you with your hand on your chin, mm-hmm. and I'm looking over there. So you just <laughs> had the eyes for it. Yeah, yeah I did. Be able to scan. Because yeah. up yeah. there, it's so thick with the, the stem count of all the little small firs and spruces and stuff. It yeah. can be hard to pick them out. But yeah. you get those snowy days in there where it's everything's white. And up there, everything is white at all times during a snowstorm. That you, they really stick out from what well, I've seen. What's nice, too, is the wind blows usually up there a little bit. And that covers your yeah. sound and stuff. Big but, time. Big time. Yeah. But I didn't really care. I didn't care if I hunted the... <laughs> Because there were big bucks there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. The swamp areas were good for big bucks. Yep. And uh, with your road work back in the day, you kind of talked about this on the podcast with with you before. With your road work, what were you specifically looking for besides bucks crossing the road? We're talking preseason. What are you looking for when you're cruising? Here's a prime example. A lot of places in New Hampshire, hardwoods. Yep. Hardwoods all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. No good. Yeah, there's deer to go through there. But you want a a swampy area on the bottom where they can winter. And then hardwoods on the top. Yep. Yep. If you can find that, you're usually going to find some nice deer somewhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Where they can winter and still go in the hardwoods to get to run around in and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's what I look for. And the deer probably back then didn't migrate as far as they do now because there's more no. deer yards before they get cut to hell i mean you've probably seen that over your years how crazy well like back in maine was the cutting back then just was it non-existent or was it well what happened was back then the state wouldn't let them cut a deer yard mm. yeah. and they finally bowed down to the money thing because mm-hmm. that's where a lot of uh, cedars were yeah mm-hmm. so they started letting them cut deer yards and that was the beginning of the end. And that was the beginning of the end. Right? That's yeah. what killed that place. Yep. Yep. Because um, I'm trying to remember the name of that mountain. When you're going to Jackman, it was on the left. And they were going to make a ski area up there, and they didn't. Oh. There was a big mountain range in the 
Yep. Parliament Pond Road went like this, and there's this big mountain right here. From the other end of it, anytime I went up on that mountain, I always found a big buck track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they started cutting from the dump road up to that big mountain. They cut all them deer, all that soft wood out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The deer went pff, gone. Gone. Yep. You go up there and wander all around up there and don't find a big buck track. Were they feeding them back then? Were they were they like they do now in towns? They everybody's not, feeding not, them. No, not much. They, they just they had no. enough food in the woods. I mean, those deer yards back down there and, and down lower, those are like the nurseries for yeah. those that yeah. kept your your young deer alive in the winter. Well, I can tell you from experience because I've been around a while. I started hunting in the fifties. When they started cutting the deer yards, the deer disappeared. Mm -hmm. Period. Yep. Mm -hmm. They just disappeared. Um. Then the coyotes showed up, too, not long after. Well, the coyotes, and another thing that Maine did, too, is you don't have the bear hunters up there you used to have. Because yep. the state got all dumb up, dumbed up on that. Yep. Same with here. Yep. So now the bear are getting the fawns. Big time. Yep. Way more than people realize. A bear's a killer of the fawns. They ain't got a chance in poor little things. No. Yeah. You know, I read a thing that said if a bear gets a scent of a fawn, it's 100%. They're getting them. They're going to kill them. And yeah. it's just they're just killers, you know. So. Yeah. Well, they smell better than a hunting dog. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They smell better than a coyote. Yep. So yep. the, the little fawn ain't got a chance. No, I mean, yeah. he's, I've heard there's a story like that bears, like in the spring, they'll find a doe that hasn't dropped her fawn yet and they can like smell it or something like you were saying. They'll, they'll just follow, follow her around, her around yep. for a month or so until she drops that fawn. As soon as it drops, it's game over, which is too bad. Yeah, for but, sure. How would you, what's that? You pause for a second. Yeah, let me get a, I gotta get a beer. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut, cut. <laughs> That'll wrap up part one of this two part series. We really appreciate you guys tuning in. If you wanna see part two, stop back in next week to get it downloaded. Thanks, guys. <laughs>